This podcast contains content which may be too intense for some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. You're listening to The Storage Papers. Episode 12, Consensus Ad Idem. Welcome back to the Storage Papers. I am pleased to report that I'm still alive, and I was not murdered in a dark alley behind a seedy bar. While I definitely have some more interesting documents I've found in the storage papers, I've also been able to make some progress in connecting some dots, so to speak. I'm starting season two off, not by sharing documents I found within the storage papers, but with an opportunity to tell you about this meeting I finally had with Ron Hammond. It went mostly how I expected it to, and still in some ways, there were a couple of unexpected turns. In a great way, though. And I know you'll be interested to hear about them. We met on a Sunday afternoon at a local coffee shop. I told him what I looked like beforehand and that I'd be wearing a black hoodie sweatshirt. Without the hood, of course. And I'd have a digital recorder on the table in front of me at the agreed-upon time. He was punctual and approached me directly without ordering anything. When he got close, I extended my hand to shake his, and he paused for a moment to look at the digital recorder and asked if I was already recording. When I told him I wasn't, he started to negotiate some terms. He didn't shake my hand. This wasn't the start I'd hoped for, but he eventually said it would be fine if I record our conversation though only if I didn't use the recording for the podcast. I was extremely disappointed by this. I mean, that was the whole point of my recording. But when I began protesting, he turned around and began to walk out. I didn't feel like I had much of a choice, so I must apologize as I won't actually be able to share any of that audio with you today. The first few minutes of our conversation were extremely awkward. I got the feeling he was sizing me up in some ways. It was obvious that he didn't necessarily trust me too much, and he made the strangest request. He asked me to roll up my sleeves so he could look at my forearms, just up to my elbows. He was quick to squeeze my arms, beginning at the elbow joint, and palpated methodically down to the fingertips, first on my left side, then on my right. Once this strange ritual had been carried out, he seemed to loosen up a bit, I asked him if he cared to explain what that was all about, and he said, not right now. As I was about to begin asking him some questions, Ron began with a barrage of his own. He asked me a lot of questions about my religious beliefs and my knowledge of scripture. He also asked if I'd ever used a Ouija board, or if I'd had any experiences obtaining psychic readings. And since I had previously mentioned being involved in paranormal investigations, if I had ever invited anyone or anything to use my body as a medium or to channel themselves through me. Just so you, the listeners, are aware, I was raised with Christian principles and went to private schools through 7th grade. My knowledge of scripture, I would say, is better than average. However, I don't attend church for personal reasons that are beyond the scope of this podcast. I refuse to dabble with Ouija boards, and no, I have never attempted to allow a spiritual entity to use my body as a vessel for communication. The only time I've received a so-called psychic reading was for a previous podcast I produced where I was interviewing someone who claimed to be psychic, and she read for me on the show.
Eventually, I asked if he was going to answer any of my questions, and he replied, Sure, though this is the first one you've asked. Before I could even reply, though, he laid into me with more questions, wanting to know what experiences I've had with demonic entities. Now, that question took some time for me to answer because ultimately I wasn't sure if some of the experiences I referenced during our conversation were actual demonic entities or something entirely different, not excluding the possibility that some could have been hallucinations on my part. He said it was best to assume they were demonic entities and to always treat those interactions with great caution. I told him about some of the shadow figures I'd seen in my home recently, as well as throughout my childhood. I also told him about a few encounters that you'd consider typical poltergeist activity, but with some atypical details like the smell of sulfur and a couple of objects, a book and a doorknob of all things, spontaneously catching fire during a couple of investigations. While he had an interest in these things, he spent the most time asking me about the winged creature I had been repeatedly seeing in my dreams. Ron seemed absolutely certain that the creature should be speaking to me in my dreams more than I could recall, and he encouraged me to keep a journal by my bed so that I could jot down notes about my dreams or any speech happening during them immediately when I wake up so that I don't forget. The conversation wasn't entirely one-sided. I asked him about the instructions he previously gave me to avoid naming any demonic entity that I encountered, and he replied more or less as I expected with a somewhat biblical-based answer. He said that naming it could have varying effects. Power is held within a name, so if you're going to go about using it, you'd better be aware of what the holder of that name is capable of. A name used to have more significance culturally speaking. Historically, when a parent would name a child, it would be after an attribute that the parent wished to bestow upon the child. A modern version of this concept would be in the name Grace or Hope. In addition, though, if you've ever done any research on exorcisms, a majority of the time involved spent by the clergy is in finding out who is possessing the victim and acquiring a name. They need to know the name of the demon in order to exert authority over it and ultimately remove it from the vessel which it inhabits. But in order to have authority, you must also have faith in God. The greater one's faith is, the greater the authority over the entity. This is why the rite of exorcism is only approved, at least in the Catholic Church, to be carried out by someone, in their perspective, with great faith. If you think about priesthood, a priest has sacrificed oneself and his personal luxuries to live a life of service. And only those priests who have demonstrated the highest of faith and have had formal training for exorcism from the Vatican are approved by the church to perform the rite. Ron went on to ask, what do you think the point or the motivation would be of a demonic entity to possess a human? I couldn't provide him a clear answer, though I had a couple theories I shared. He basically told me I was incorrect and explained that, biblically speaking, it can be contrived that we humans are capable of having equal authority that Jesus himself would have. But we're flawed. Demons know this, and they're jealous of the potential we possess. You have to ask yourself, do demons have faith? Of course they do, he said. They search for power and authority in a way that we can acquire it. They don't wish to rule in heaven. They wish to spoil God's greatest creation, human beings, out of cruelty, jealousy, revenge, hatred, and spite for the Creator. If you can't hurt someone directly, you hurt what they love. These are the motives of the purely evil. I continued asking questions. One of the questions I asked was about the video that he claimed to obtain of that cloudy, dark entity from his pocket video camera that he told me about in his letter. He not only confirmed he still had the video, but he showed it to me on his phone. The audio was subpar for sure, but the video quality was exceptionally good for having been converted from its original magnetic tape form into digital. 
I was shocked at what I saw. The video shows him clearly walking out a door into an alleyway, and then it turns to face a dumpster on his left. You can see a woman's calves and feet and heels laying on the ground on the other side of the dumpster. Then, as the camera slowly pans wide, it's just as Ron described, a shadowy figure hovering above a woman's body. You can see it morph into a man and turn upright to walk toward Ron. Then an up-close shot of the man's tie before he goes out of frame, and Ron runs over to the woman. I asked him to rewind the video to get a still shot of the man's face. To my astonishment, he was bald, and I couldn't make out any eyebrows. He was smiling that wide-toothed grin I'd become so familiar with. Yes, these facial features were somewhat different than the images I'd seen of Malcolm Foy, but the other features were shockingly similar. Ron confirmed my suspicion that this had been the very demonic entity that now possesses Malcolm. At this point in the conversation, I couldn't help but ask why he had an interest in meeting me and allowing me to continue the podcast based on his collection of documents. I don't know what it was about this part of our conversation, but I felt like he was lying. He claimed that listening to these events was refreshing his memory regarding some of the details of the cases, and that it was a huge help to him in reviewing details that maybe he originally dismissed. I tried asking him about what happened in his law enforcement career. Well, he refused to answer any questions about that and politely asked me to move on. So I brought up his trip to Tijuana. He actually seemed enthusiastic to inform me about his trip. I finally began to feel like he was getting comfortable around me. Ron said there were actually several reasons he was there. First, he had been researching Preston Nicholson. You remember the magician's apprentice from episode 6? and he learned that he'd been adding to his skill set some psychic mediumship and communication with the dead, along with some other rumored abilities. All of this was according to some subreddit, where Ron claimed to have made a connection with Nicholson himself, and they apparently had some dialogue for a little while under a throwaway account. And then he heard local rumors that an amazing mentalist was performing shows in Tijuana, in English only, similar to the documented accounts by the FBI back in 1997. Ron said he sent a message to his contact on Reddit, informing him that he would like to meet with him, if he's actually who he said he'd claimed to be online, and took a chance by traveling down there. But then Ron shared another reason for traveling there, one which he didn't even truly grasp the entire significance of until he was able to meet with Nicholson. See, Ron was convinced that he could recruit some help for Brianne Scanlon, whom he felt was undergoing the preliminary stages of oppression and quite possibly possession herself. He's a devout Catholic, he doesn't miss Mass, and he had attended a local church during his stay in Tijuana while he was there for his trip to meet Nicholson. Prior to this trip, he had tracked down a priest who was originally an American and had been transferred to the church in Tijuana. He had also been trained by the Vatican in the rite of exorcism. And one particular priest, he learned, had an excellent reputation and was scheduled to travel throughout California in the next few months to speak to other dioceses about his experiences with exorcism. So even though Ron had previously planned on soliciting this priest's help, he figured he was killing two birds with one stone on this trip. But he got sidetracked by a week or so when he met with Nicholson. He said, in fact, that they had had several meetups and developed a rapport. He even said they'd been listening to the podcast episode about him and had a good laugh over it. And then most recently, they had agreed to meet one last time for another discussion. The specific topic, Ron wouldn't say, but he did mention it was related to Project Hydra. They had become rather casual with one another 
and agreed to have a beer over their discussion when Nicholson noticed another episode of The Storage Papers had come out. So they sat and listened to episode 10, Original Beast. When I got to the end of the episode and spoke of the postcard from Catalina Island, with three signatures, Ron said he was dumbfounded. If you recall, the signatures were supposedly those of people whose bodies had been inhabited by the beast, the Cursed Ones. There were two first names, Ivanov and Maxwell, referring to Ivanov Vasiliev, the originally cursed Russian soldier, and Maxwell Stannard, the U.S. intelligence officer and spy who claimed to have knowledge of Project Hydra and that the curse was passed on to. But the third name on the postcard, Lucas Stone, was what caused Ron to really lose his mind. He had the man's name in the papers the whole time, but didn't recall it or simply failed to make the connection. Lucas Stone was the name of the American priest he had been researching, the exorcist. This was the priest that he'd hoped to connect with to help Brienne. Ron spoke a lot with me about fate and the concept of divine intervention. I mean, what are the chances that Ron had this single mention of Lucas Stone's name from a postcard dated in 1986 that seemed so insignificant back then? And now, the same man, who, according to the storage papers, may actually be a werewolf and a priest who trained at the Vatican, that Ron needs help from. He had a tie-in to his identity so many years before it even became relevant, and it was so easily overlooked. I couldn't help but to feel like I contributed to something here, even though it may be just a small part. Ron acknowledged the unlikely probability of this, and as we wrapped up our conversation, he asked me to relay a message to Detective Anderson, who had helped him find Preston Nicholson. I'm not at liberty to discuss the message at the moment, but it was clear I had to find him soon. Ron gave me a couple leads that should allow me to reach him quickly. He did encourage me to keep the podcast going and said that it was, quote, doing some good. I got the distinct impression that he had ulterior motives for encouraging me to do the podcast, but so long as it aligns with my plans to keep more episodes coming, I guess I'm game. We left with plans to reconnect soon, and he urged me to continue strengthening my faith so that I, again, quote, don't become compromised. And he reminded me that I have authority over any of these demonic entities should they pay me a visit. Before we parted, Ron gave me a discerning look as if still trying to weigh my intentions. He asked me how involved I wanted to be with this work, if I preferred to be behind the scenes reorganizing the storage papers and looking for relevant information on his current tasks of both helping Brianne Scanlon and looking further into Project Hydra. I asked for some clarification, since I didn't really believe my podcast was a behind-the-scenes role. Then he handed me a folded piece of paper and said, If you're truly interested in helping and finding some valuable information, take your voice recorder here and start asking some questions. I unfolded the piece of paper, which had an address in La Mesa written on it. Then he said, just make sure to ask permission to use anything you discuss on your podcast before putting it out there. Then he got up, finally shook my hand, and walked out. Ron texted me some photos a few hours later after our meeting with a series of symbols, saying, look for these in the search for Hydra documents. After I got home, I did a quick internet search of the address from the piece of paper he gave me. I didn't find anything unusual about the location. It looked like a small residential home near a shopping center and across the street from a church. Maybe I'll just take a drive out there within the next week or two. Two days after my meeting with Ron, I received a small book-sized package in the mail. I was surprised to see a couple of pages of paper with handwriting on it and directly underneath it wrapped in bubble wrap and enclosed in a Ziploc bag 
was a flash drive. The letter read, Dear Jeremy, Ron tells me you have checked out OK and are interested in assisting us with some research. After he shared episode two of your podcast with me, this was the one referencing a flash drive with the video of a man spontaneously appearing in a hotel parking lot, I wanted to make sure you were trustworthy before asking for your involvement. If Ron trusts you, and I trust Ron, then you must be okay. The fact is, the homicide that occurred at that hotel is a cold case. I mentioned the contents of the flash drive to my chief at the time, and the only evidence documented in the official report was a still shot of the person's face from the video. He made sure the paranormal stuff wasn't included. We've also never been able to make a connection to the case with any of the medical files contained on the flash drive. I'd like to ask for your assistance, since you're now in possession of what you refer to as the storage papers, in searching for any documents linking to this homicide and or any of the medical documents on the USB drive itself. There are a couple things I'd like to point out though. I've placed the medical documents in their own folder on the drive, but I've also added a folder named Evidence. Within that folder, you'll find a full copy of the official police report, as well as results from forensic testing, photographs of the crime scene, and a longer version of the video you previously mentioned on your show. I had the security footage downloaded for one hour prior to the appearance of the man, and for one hour following his exit from the screen. You should also be aware that Brianne Scanlon and her brother, Ben, have medical documents on that flash drive. You'll also see some lab results for Malcolm Foy, along with many other patient files. I have exhausted my resources at the police department in an attempt to find references to anyone else's medical files and known homicides, kidnappings, or any other crimes. In fact, it's my hope that since I've come to a dead end, Perhaps you might be able to cross-reference some of the names with those medical documents with any potential connections to the storage papers. Ideally, you'd be able to pay special attention to any names relating to your search for Project Hydra documents to reference these medical files. My hunch is that there may be a connection there somehow. If you do find anything, please make sure to reach out. Below, I have listed my personal cell and email address. Good luck and let me know if I can be of any assistance. Mark Anderson. I don't know why, but when I held this flash drive in my hands for the first time, it seemed surreal. This podcast was supposed to be interesting or even entertaining. Now it feels like something more almost like an obligation. Not a reluctant one per se, but it's not just some story that I'm reading about. It just got real for me, and I feel a sense of moral obligation or duty to see if I can help. As I dug further into these medical files, I began creating a basic Excel spreadsheet over the break with names and patient demographics. Of course, ethically speaking, I can't share some of the specifics in association with actual names of people who, when I think about it, may very well still be alive and living near me. I'm not even sure if I can get into trouble for sharing information contained within, but I will also be continuing my search for any documents related to Project Hydra in real time, and checking this spreadsheet for correlating names or other information. I will also continue sharing some of the other documents that may or may not be related with the promise that I'll keep you posted as I learn more and as events may unfold. Before I end this episode, I should share some patterns that I have already found simply by placing a few filters and sorting a few items on the spreadsheet I created. All of these records appear to have had lab work done, and more specifically, some kind of genetic testing not covered by insurance. This stuck out to me for two reasons. First, because the lab is not local. 
And second, there were positive markers relating to a very specific gene mutation on each one. I've tried to research these specific results online, as well as in some well-established medical journals. Unfortunately, I've come up with nothing explaining the significance of these results. Maybe it's coincidence, but aside from all records coming from the same hospital, and the patient's residences being located in San Diego County, this is the only pattern I can see at the moment. I should also mention that some of the medical files contain photographs of the patients. Brianne Scanlon's was one of them. When I first looked at it, I thought she was pretty, but there was something familiar about her photo that I didn't quite see at first. It was bothering me, but the more I looked at it, the more I was frustrated until I gave up. It's like that feeling you get when you're watching a TV show and you see an actor that you recognize from something else, but you can't quite figure it out. And then later it'll just come to you when you aren't even thinking about it. That was exactly the case here. I had given up, and I was on my way back to work on Friday. If you listen to the trailer for this season, you'll recall an elderly woman in a purple dress in my dream that spoke to me in Latin, and not in a woman's voice. Brianne Scanlon was the elderly woman in my dream, only her medical record picture shows her looking younger than me. My dream depicted her as a woman who appears to be at least in her 70s. How is that possible? I would love to hear your thoughts on all of this. You can always reach me by social media or email. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Storage Papers or email me at thestoragepapers at gmail.com. You can also leave me a voice message at anchor.fm slash thestoragepapers. Make sure to reference episode 12, Consensus Ad Idem, in your subject line. And if you do reach out, please let me know if I have your permission to share what you've said. I'll be back very soon with more documents to share from the storage papers.